Good evening. Uh, we're going to be studying not the minor prophets, just minor prophets. We're not studying all 12 of them. That would take us a couple years to do this on Wednesday nights if we did everything in depth. Uh, I've chosen, if you read your sheet, the second page of the sheet, I've chosen um, several of the prophets, Obadiah, Joel, and those two are going to be separate. But Jonah and Nahum are going to be taught together. Uh, they appear about a, in history about 100 years apart, but they deal with the same topic, and one completes the other. And so um, then we're going to do Zephaniah and Huldah. Now, most people don't know Huldah. She didn't write any books, but uh, she's a very influential prophet in the Old Testament. You shouldn't call her a prophet, prophetess. Um, they actually have a feminine form of the word, and she is one and was highly trusted. Um, and we're going to look at her and Zephaniah together because they both have a similar theme. And then um, my, in some ways, favorite prophet will be looking at Habakkuk. Um, it's, um, I uh, always try to remind myself on some of these names um, to figure out how to pronounce them, and uh, yeah, 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 that's always been a problem for people, it turns out. How do you pronounce Habakkuk? Uh, I'm going to do one of the ways that you pronounce it, but uh, uh, they, they obviously had a problem with this guy's name, and so we'll look at those eventually, but tonight, what we're going to look at is an introduction to the prophets. Uh, hopefully, I can get through this. If I can, I'll do a little bit of it next week and then start with Obadiah. Um, Obadiah is the first of what we call the literary prophets. He wrote before everybody else, and so we'll start with him. And he deals with a very important theme. Um, in that. So, But tonight, we'll, as we uh, look at this, I'll talk about types of prophets and then testing prophets. And this is a very important thing. Even in our day and age, people say, well, do we have prophets today? Well, we have people claiming to be. And so it's very important to uh, be able to test the prophets. Uh, and I'm going to discuss that in a moment. But before we do, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin this study. And we'll continue this um, as long as we have time. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Todd and I talked about how many weeks it's going to be. It's somewhere between 10 and 15 weeks. There are 10 weeks with meal, 15 weeks, five weeks without meal maybe. Uh, we'll go and finish these things out. When we finish, we finish, and that's it. Okay, and so I'm glad to do this. This is my uh, uh, outlet for my calling, my desire to teach. I have that desire, and uh, I never knew what God was going to do with me, and this is what he did with me. Uh, I wasn't going to be a professor, but I turned out to be a professor, and so we're going to do what I'm called to do, and that's the short of it. Let's have a prayer, though. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for this class. We're thankful that people have chosen to study these things. We pray, Father, that we would not only approach this as an intellectual thing, but, Father, as a way of advancing your kingdom and understanding you and how you work. We pray, Father, for your blessing on us. We pray for the advancement of the kingdom. We pray for our daily needs. We pray for um, the work of the church, and we pray that the work of the church will be greatly magnified because of what we do at times like this. For we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, um, where do we start? Uh, I was going to put this on the sheet, and then I decided not to, and then I decided to. So there's going to be a little bit of what's not on the sheet. There's a big debate in Christianity about what I mentioned before, whether we have prophets or not. People say, well, there are two views. One is we don't, and the other is we do. Actually, there are three views on this, uh, according to people. One is we don't, the other is we do. 
have prophets, okay? But the third one, uh, I'm going to describe it this way. The, those that say that we don't have prophets today are what we call cessationists. They ceased with the apostles or the people that apostles laid hands on. You may, may have heard this view before in life. Uh, do we have prophets? And then you have the other group that says they're everywhere. I had a student once who said, well, we've got at least 12 prophets in our church. And I said, what, what, what's wrong with your church? And they, they said, what? I said, well, prophets usually in the Old Testament appear when there's a problem, a big problem. And if you have 12 of them, you have a big problem here. And uh, the kid thought about it a little bit, and he said, oh, we're not that type of prophet. Okay. Uh, the other view, uh, we call those continuationists. Uh, cessationists, they ceased. Continuation, we always have them. The third view is what um, one of my predecessors at Cincinnati Christian, um, I've got to think what they called it, Cincinnati Bible Seminary at that time, Jim Smith called the conservationist. We don't have them everywhere, but if God needs one, he can raise one up. And uh, and he held to the view that if, if you've got a prophet, you've got a problem, okay? Now, that's, that's, people say, well, what are you? I'm a conservationist because at least you have two prophets appear at the end of time. In Revelation 11, there are the two prophets who um, appear and do all sorts of miraculous things and whatever. Okay, well, that might suggest to me that we have God can at least do th certain things at certain times. There's always rumors on the mission field of occasionally God doing something. I know uh, of a preacher and who, uh, let's say, put it this way, he was... I'm one of these guys uh, who can't preach, okay? I, I hate imitating him, but he wasn't a good preacher that way. So he went to the mission field, and uh, people did for him what they did here. He, they didn't listen to him, but they had been having a drought, and uh, when he started his preaching this one time, all of a sudden, lightning came down from the sky, struck the ground behind him, and rain came. Now, was he doing a miracle or was that just coincidence? I don't know, but I have a God who can do something if it's necessary, okay? Now, does he always do it? I don't think so, okay? But it's something that we have to deal with. They're always going to be with us false prophets. I need to know what they are. But what is a real prophet? Okay, there are five things that I look at, what I call five poles to being a real prophet. First, first pole is the first thing in, ever introduced by a prophet, about a prophet. Uh, in Ab Abraham, in the book of Genesis, chapter 20, verse 7, uh, you know, he didn't always act like he should, okay? He had this bad habit of if he got into trouble with someone, he was afraid that they would take his wife. For example, the Pharaoh in Genesis chapter uh, tw uh, 12 saw Sarah and said, hubba hubba, and whatever the <laughs> Pharaoh said, I don't know what he said, but he, he said, man, that's a fine-looking woman. And if you do the dating right, it could be he was really an old man. And so if she's in her 60s in that story, to a man who's in his 90s, he says, well, 60-year-old woman, young girl, you know, or something like that. Well, obviously, God doesn't tell you to let your wife go be with someone else, and so God restored her to Abraham. But he tried that a second time with this Philistine lord, and he prevented that Philistine lord from doing anything of the sexual nature, and um, he appeared to that Philistine lord in a dream and said, don't touch that woman, for she's married. 
okay? And if you do, you're going to be in trouble. You can read the 20th chapter. And he said, you need to have that guy pray for you because he is a prophet, and I will answer his prayers. So one of the jobs of a prophet is to pray. Uh, I could give you all sorts of examples, the prayers of the prophets. Uh, it was a study I was going to do one time and haven't done yet. But um, Daniel the prophet, in the ninth chapter of Daniel, in his great prophecy about the coming of the Christ, what's he do? He has a prayer that dominates most of the chapter. People always want to get to the prophecy about the Christ, but they don't want to read the prayer. Or the prophet Jeremiah, oh, if it's lawful to call his prayers prayers, uh, we can, excuse me, we can call them complaints. And some, there are things like that. Um, the, so uh, we, Habakkuk chapter 3 is a prayer, great prayer, about how God changed the prophet and got the prophet to align himself with what God was saying. Habakkuk, and we're going to study him later, he's, he's going to be complaining about things. God says, you need to change. Okay? And um, he does. And he has this marvelous prayer at the, at the end. So prophets can pray. Uh, Elijah can pray. Okay, a, a second task of a, jo a prophet is preaching. Uh, they do a lot of this. I, I was studying this once. I was going over this, and people said, I thought prophets was only, were only about predicting. No, no. Most of their time is spent preaching things, especially Jeremiah, the preaching prophet. Um, my favorite sermon of Jeremiah is Jeremiah chapter 5. If you turn with me there. Um, this is a very famous sermon. It's called the Temple Sermon. And um, this is um, I got the wrong chapter. Why did I do that? Um, oh. Well, I, for some reason, what's that? No, it's my fault. This one is my fault. Uh, oh, this is embarrassing. going to give up in a second. Uh, it's chapter 7. Duh. Um, anyway, um, he said, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Now, what is he telling him to do? He said, stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Oh, he's going to be standing in a very public place. Um, he, ha he has a right to be in the temple. The Lord's house is the temple. He has a right to be there because he's of a priestly family. But he's not in the temple. He's not outside the temple. He's in what one man called no man's land. Okay, in other words, um, um, he, he's, you can't touch him there. Uh, and so... Uh, Lord's putting him in a place where he can't be touched. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. And then notice what, it, what it, the message is. Reform your ways and your actions, and I'll let you live in this place. Now, what does he mean by this place? Does he mean the country? Or does he mean go to the temple? And uh, if you reform, you get to stay here. Well, within, this is the year 605 B.C., and in the year 586, they didn't do that, and the temple was destroyed. 
and God gave them opportunity to repent, and they did not. So a preaching prophet, I don't know why I said Jeremiah 5, it's obviously 7. Um, the third type is prediction. Um, you have all sorts of things. My favorite predicting prophet is the book of Daniel, chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 11 through 12. You predict things in the future, or Isaiah 53. I didn't put that one down, but uh, the big prediction is the predictions of the Christ, uh, or of judgment. They, they have a, a way of picturing a good future and a bad future, and this is very important. And then you have prophets of power. Uh, not every prophet is going to do every one of these things. Um, power prophets mainly do acts of power. No, they can preach and all that. They can pray and so on. But a power prophet would be Elijah. We taught a course here. I think I'm getting this <laughs> group confused. Uh, uh, we taught a course on Elijah. He was a power prophet. He could call down fire from the sky. Okay. Uh, he could part the water of the Jordan River, just like Joshua did uh, back in the book of Joshua. And he is endowed with power. And if you look at these things, uh, guess what? Most of these things, all of these things, I shouldn't say most, were fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus was not only Messiah, Jesus was the Christ. He was the prophet like unto Moses, and that's going to be uh, a major issue. Uh, prophets have to be like Moses, but Jesus is not only like Moses, but he's more than Moses was ever. So these things. Um, and then the fifth one, I added this when I used to only teach four things, the four Ps. I've got five Ps now, persecuted. Because of what Jesus said in Matthew 23, if you... Open your New Testament to Matthew chapter 23. And then 26. Um, this is a, a passage that is very difficult to read. It can be read two ways. Um, the one way people read Matthew 23 is with anger. And you can read it. This is the passage that, woe unto you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, if you've read that passage. He goes on uh, time after time telling the fiendish things that the scribes do. Or you can read it with extreme anger, or you can read it with extreme sorrow. And uh, I remember the first time I read it with extreme sorrow at the urging of someone who has been very influential on me. And don't read it, woe unto you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Read it, woe unto you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Read it with extreme sadness. This is Jesus being sad, I believe. Now, why? Uh, ver if you look at verse 37, how do you read this with anger? Well, you can, but I, I prefer reading it with sorrow. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I, I desire to gather you together her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. See, it's, it's, it's a sad, sad story. Woe to you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. And um, sometimes... Uh, how we read something affects how we understand it. And I read this as the sadness of Jesus. And the city will be destroyed a second time. It was destroyed in 586 B.C., and then the Romans destroyed it in 70 A.D. Um, or A.D. 70, I'm 
you always put the AD first. I, I got to quit making that mistake. I, I won't. But uh, in AD 70, it was destroyed again. So prophets are people who are extremely persecuted. Um, there is a debate about prophets. I'm not going to go through all of this. But um, there are two types of prophets. One is the, the guy who holds the prophetic office. Now, this is either in the New Testament or the Old Testament. You can run into this phenomenon. Sometimes the guy isn't a prophet by profession, but has the prophetic gift just temporarily. For example, um, the New Testament example would be Caiaphas. If you look on uh, Roman numeral 1b, uh, sub point 1a, an example in the New Testament would be Caiaphas, for it says of him, now he did not say this on his own initiative. He gives a prophecy. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. This guy all of a sudden just blurred something out. and I, I always wonder if people say, why did you say that? I don't know. But see, God moved the high priest at the trial of Jesus to say, this guy's got to die for the nation. Now, if he meant something, God meant something else by it. So uh, this is even a New Testament uh, thing. Uh, if you look at point C under that, another example would be Balaam. He was not in the prophetic office. He was a false prophet. He was a sorcerer of some type, a div uh, practiced divination, uh, what m one of my teachers called a professional cursor. <laughs> the guy of Balak, the king of Moab, hired him to go and curse Israel. And so every time he steps out to curse, what happens? Hey, I can't do that. I've got, I got to bless. The Lord won't let me do that. Yahweh won't let me do that. And so he blesses. So he doesn't have the prophetic office, but for a moment, he had the prophetic gift. Uh, or a third possibility is Saul, who walked among the prophets, but was not one. Was not one. Um, some, Saul goes out to take David one time, and he starts prophesying with the prophets. He lays down naked. And it's, it's kind of a funny story that God overcomes the man. And so he prophesies, but he's not a prophet. Um, the prophetic office is what we're going to look at in this study. You know, it's, it's the important thing. Does this person have that office? Now, if someone is a prophet, we'll keep reading this phrase. You've got to obey him. but you better be sure that he is a prophet. You catch the irony. You better obey him, but don't you dare go after the false prophets. Well, how do you handle this? Well, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are tests of prophets. Uh, if you turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13. Moses is very aware of this problem. Prophets existed before Moses. Pagan prophets did. Even Abraham was a prophet. Moses is going to be the supreme prophet of the Old Testament, and Jesus is going to be the one of the New but um, you notice in chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, it says this, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams, a dreamer of dreams, appears among you, announces to you whether a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder which he has spoken takes place, he says, now notice, he can do miracles. Um, can false prophets today do miracles? I don't know. 
Um, some of them claim to. I know, a, quote unquote, a witch. And she says, oh, yes, we can. Okay. Doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean you're on God's side. But notice, how do you deal with someone doing a miracle? A miracle by itself is not determinative. And look at what this prophet who does a miracle says. Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must, of dreamers must be put to death. Oh, wow. Well, because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God. So the Israelites weren't just to say, he did a miracle. He must be a prophet. Well, he's a prophet, but is he a prophet of God? And so um, that's, that's the question. Now, that's the first test. Well, okay. That says something. Now, if the second text that Moses deals with this is in Deuteronomy 18. This is a very complicated text. If you look in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 22, Moses is very concerned about this, that you realize this. When you enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Now, he's going to give a list of the detestable ways. Now, I want to explain a Hebrew word here. I, didn't, I should have put this on the uh, sheet, but I didn't. Uh, the word detestable is what we call an onomatopoeia in English. Now, you may know the word or you may have not dealt with it for a long time. But an onomatopoeia is a word that sounds like a sound. Zip, zap, zzz. Yeah. Um, the word is, I've, I've got to do this one uh, apart from the stand. This is one suggestion of what the word is. Now, there are people who contest this, but it makes sense. The guy throwing up. It's, uh, this is what makes God puke. Okay, that's a possibility. But it's, 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 it's a thing. Uh, it, it's a detestable thing. You can hear it just in that word itself. So what makes God upset? Let's just do a mild interpretation. Okay, what makes him upset? Well, there's a list of things. The one, the first one, is if he practices what we call occult sacrifice. He makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. Now, this could have been done several ways. Or in fact, I think it, pretty sure it was done several ways. Um, it could be a rite of manhood. Yeah, you build a fire and you make the kid run through it, and if he survives, he's God's person, the God's person. No. They sacrifice their kids in fire. Um, I don't know if any of you knew Dr. Bullard that used to teach at Cincinnati Christian. You knew Dr. Bullard. Dr. Bullard um, excavated. He was an archaeologist and geologist. They wanted him because he could identify rocks, and they, these archaeologists weren't really good with those types of things. And <laughs> Doc, they called him Doc Rock. What is this? And, uh, I've got a great story, but it takes too long to tell how he made his fame. But he sacrificed, sacrificed. He excavated at Carthage, and they now Carthage is in North Africa. 
And most people don't know this, but the Carthaginians were Baal worshipers. Okay? And um, they would uh, dig up these urns. And inside the urns were the burned bodies of children. Now, when you burn somebody, um, you don't, it doesn't destroy all the bones. And so when they analyzed the bones, they found out an interesting fact. According to Dr. Bullard, this wasn't published um, by a lot of people. Because the children were four years old and under. Now, my granddaughter, I watch my granddaughter five days of the week, and she just turned five. But I couldn't conceive of burning her. And on the urn, they uh, put an inscription. In English, the letters would be L, L, M, L, K which is they didn't have vowels in their alphabets. So Lamelech, to the king. Who's the Lamelech? Uh, well, you um, probably read this name in scripture. Uh, you'll be back Sunday. Okay, so are you living? Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, they they would burn these children, and then they would devote it to the king. Now, what do they mean by the king? The king of the country? No, the king of the gods was Lamelech. Uh, you in the scripture they call him Moloch. Have you ever read Moloch? Well, that's not really the name, because what they did was they took the vowels. In later Hebrew, they'd take the vowels from the word shameful, bosha, o, o and E, and they put with melech, it became mulek, to the shameful king or something. We, we don't, it was, they just didn't want to call his name. So they would pass the children through fire, and it wasn't just the Baal worshipers. Um, Chemosh was another god. Um, the, 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 all sorts of gods would require child sacrifice. God says, no. If your prophet sacrifices a child, he's not a prophet. Oh, he's a prophet, but not from him. Okay. And so the first test, what, these are the things he doesn't do. Now, the, the rest of the list is very debated as to what they infer. Maybe they're just alternate names. Uh, one guy I read suggested, and I think he's right, that they just list every word for these false prophets, and they, they're just saying, this guy, this guy, this guy, whatever term he uses. Um, false prophecy, uh, for example, divination, kosem uh, kesamim in Hebrew, interesting thing. That's one of the ones that's in Ezekiel uh, 21, 21 is explained how they do some of these things, all sorts of things. Or sorcery, um, uh, which is me'unain, observe or interpret phenomena like clouds. If you look up the sky, I, I, if you've ever done this, I tried to see when I was a kid faces in the clouds. I saw Abraham Lincoln once. Maybe Abraham Lincoln was looking down on me joking. <laughs> but uh, uh, these, uh, this word is based on the word for clouds, and I, I have called it Mr. Cloudy. He, he, he can read something into that natural phenomenon. Or, um, um, oh, there's a mistake, interprets omens. It omens. <laughs> uh, I had a problem. I told you before I had a problem with my keyboard. Uh, this is the word manahesh. Um, this is interpreted two ways. Um, anahash in the, he's, can be the word for snake. Some people think 
that what these guys did was they watched the snake and they, inter they inferred something about the future from how the snake wiggled, which direction it went, or it, it, all sorts of things. Uh, some people think it deals with the word copper because snakes or fiery serpents were copper colored. I don't know. Um, witchcraft, Mecca shave. Now this is the one that is extremely interesting because Kashaf, and I feel like I'm complaining too much here, but it means to chop. And some people think what these guys were doing was chopping up potions and don't know what the drug was, but getting high as a kite, and, oh, I saw the Lord, you know. Uh, I had a guy once uh, who told me, oh, I saw your God. I'm there, okay, what did he look like? He said, he looked like you, Dan, except bigger. <laughs> and they're great. And this guy was getting high as a kite, you know, all the time. Uh, now, you don't get high and do that. Um, but some of these deal with um, having power. One who casts a spell. Who bear, ha bear. Bind with a spell or a medium. Shall... Shoel Ov, calling on a dead forefather. Uh, this is where you, um, oh, my Aunt Matilda. I don't have my Aunt Matilda. But uh, Aunt Matilda, answer me, whatever. And you call on the forefather. Or Dad, will you answer me? And so they would call on the forefather. Um, but the seventh one there, that Roman numeral seven, the spiritus, the you don't need. This is translated in many of your translations, the familiar spirit. This is the guy who has a spirit he always, he always consults. And the spirit tells him things. Now, there may be a spirit there, and it may tell him something, but it's not God. Um, and then, um, then the one who calls up the dead. And you see how some of these overlap. Um, so you're either trying to find out information from these occult practices or you're trying to do occult power. Some of them are both, like chopping your kid up, burning it in fire. Okay, well, that's what you can't do. You do that, you're not from God. Now, we have examples of some of these things. One of the favorite stories of people is the witch of Endor in 1 Samuel. And if you read the witch of Endor, uh, King Saul goes to her and says, how about calling up the spirit of Samuel the prophet? Now, you read that story, and I think she was expecting one thing, and she got something else. She was expecting probably her familiar spirit, okay, or the dead relative, you know, um, to come. And if you read the story, she screams when she sees the, uh, the spirit of Saul. <laughs> She's, she gets afraid because this is not what she expected. But Samuel in that visionary thing, whether it was Samuel or whatever, Sam, angelic power, tells her the same thing, tells Saul the same thing that he told him in his life. You're in trouble, buddy. You're in trouble. So this is what a prophet can't be. What is he like? Well, if you read verses 15 through 15 and 18, text is a little small on me. Uh, the Lord your God will raise up for you, like me, from your own brothers. Okay, now notice there are two things there. Um, he, he's got to be an Israelite. Uh, if he's got the prophetic office, not the prophetic gift, because Balaam wasn't an Israelite and he got the gift for a second, even though he was unwilling, but God, that was a special thing. 
But the prophetic office, this is the guy you have to listen to in every way. He has to be an Israelite. Now, this is Old Testament. Okay? Uh, and he has to be, and I don't know why I didn't list this one, he has to be um, like Moses. Now, what that means, we're not sure. It's not like in every way, because if you go to the last chapter of Deuteronomy, let's go. I borrowed Todd's Bible and so um, left my Bible that I usually use in my truck. Um, Verse 10 of the last chapter, chapter 34. Since then, no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, what? this is a strange thing. What is, there are prophets, they're like Moses, but they're not completely like Moses. They don't see God face to face like Moses did. Now, what does that mean? His vision of God was more profound than any other prophet up to that time. And the Gospel of John, if you, uh, if you ever read the Gospel of John, chapter 1 is implying that Jesus is the, is the prophet like Moses because if you look in John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, can quote it, but I <laughs> in the beginning was the word, the word was, what does it say next? With God. Now, can I pick on you? Okay. When it says he's with God, It can mean face to face with God. How special is Jesus? As the eternal word, he's face to face with God. He's prostantheon in Greek. He's, he's toward the God. Now, this means, I'm not sure what all this means, but I know this. The great seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, what do they do? When they see God, the vision of a vision of God, they take wings and they cover their face. They take wings and they cover the thou lower parts of their body, and with the other two wings they fly. <laughs> if you can imagine this this creature with six wings flying with two and doing, <laughs> holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. But Jesus is face to face with Him. I am. I feel. Um, not just feel, I'm sure that the experience of Jesus being face to face with the Father was much greater than being face to face, Moses being face to face with God. Um, but in Deuteronomy 18, let's go back there. 1818, um, it's going to emphasize some of these things again. Um, I will raise up for you them a prophet like you, see it's like Moses, from among their brothers, he's an Israelite, I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Uh, and you have to listen. That's the, the point. You have to listen to him if he is a prophet. Now this is why it becomes so important. Is he a prophet or not a prophet? Um, Look at verse 20. There is a wor warning here in verse 20. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Now, for a person who occasionally preaches, and I know preachers who this has special meaning for because they've said they do, you can't go beyond the word. You know, you can't assume certain things. 
that you can guess, God, you just speak what is basically the message that's there. Jesus died. He was buried. He was resurrected. I, I feel comfortable with that. Um, but you can't just say, well, this is what I think. Well, that you can say that, but it's only what you think. But you can't say, thus saith the Lord, because I said it. Okay? That's a false prophet who goes way beyond what Scripture and what God told him to say. Okay, now... How do I know he is speaking presumptuously? Verse 21 and 22. You can say to yourself, no, see, God's anticipating our problem. How can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? That's a good question. I, I won't say who, but I follow this one. I think he's probably a false prophet, but I don't know that he is yet. Um, he had one thing that sort of came true and a lot of things that haven't come true yet. So I'll give the guy a chance. But you may say, how can we know that he, when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken that prophet has spoken presumptuously. Now, notice it doesn't say kill him. It just says to you, don't listen to him. And so you, you can't listen to this guy because he's not a prophet. Okay. You know, hopefully your page is like mine. Todd printed yours out. I printed mine out. Uh, uh, page two. There's an exception to this. When does something not come true and the guy still be a true prophet? Now, this is what we're going to deal with in Jonah and Nahum. Um, I think I said that. We'll examine this in the study of Jonah and Nahum. A prophecy of judgment is always considered conditional. The only thing that can make judgment ta not take place is for you to repent. That's what Jeremiah was saying in chapter 7. Why did I say chapter 5? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, chapter 7, Jeremiah was saying, uh, if you make good or you amend your ways, you make them good, you can live in this place. But if you don't, you can't. Okay, see, it's a condition. Now, in Jonah... Todd um, preached a series of sermons on Jonah. Um, I'm going to, because we talked about what he was going to say and all that. You know, we, people talk with one another about preaching and all that. But um, here was the basic message to Nineveh, to the Assyrian capital. And yet... Forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, in their language, Jonah only had to know eight words. A uh, guy who knew Akkadian tried to figure out what you would, how you would say that in Akkadian. It was eight words. God can tell a man eight words. <laughs> and yet, forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Yet, forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And it wasn't. Why? Because everybody from the poor people up to the king repented. Repentance is the thing that averts judgment. And um, this is an important thing. Um, my one teacher called this the H. L. Ellison principle. A scholar called H. L. Ellison said this very eloquently that, and I can't do it to repeat him, but anyway. Uh, I can't find his book. In other words, I have his book, but I can't find it. I probably loaned it to somebody. and It's never been returned. Okay, now, how do you know someone's a prophet? You know, you, you've got these tests. But if you look at some of these other passages, uh, one of the things that people point to, and there should have been a colon, colon after Samuel, um, is 1 Samuel 3. If you turn over to that book, 
uh, New Testament book of Hebrews um, in chapter 11 seems to be making Samuel one of the greatest of the prophets because he talks about his faith and um, he talks about Samuel and the other prophets. Okay, so something special about Samuel. And in chapter 3, we find out what is special. We have a procedure of how this man became a prophet. Uh, first of all, he receives a call. Now, that is first, eight, first 18 verses of this. We're not going to look at every one of these things. But um, little Samuel, he's a little boy. And you have to understand, I wish Todd would have put in the blackboard up because uh, I could do this. But... Um, the temple has an outer courtyard that would be like that area out there. Um, it has a holy place, which would be like this. And then there's a holy of holies. Now, there's a curtain between these areas of the temple. And this little boy technically should not go in the temple because you can't go in the temple until you, unless you're a priest. Well, he not only goes into the temple, he goes into the Holy of Holies, which usually carries a death penalty with it. The high priest can only go there on Day of Atonement. All the other days, he stays away from that area. He totally stays away from that area. Or, and when he goes into that thing, he first goes in there with a sacrifice for himself in the temple itself. He has to carry the blood in from the, that animal. And then the second time he goes in, he co takes the blood of another animal and he makes atonement for the people. Then he goes out and, and announces salvation. You know, this guy's going in and going out. He, he's, he's hurrying. Now, Regular priests can go to the holy place, which would be this section. They can go if they've got a specific task. Now, every day a priest would go in this. They, um, they would light the light, the lampstand. Um, you could burn incense. Uh, there was a table of bread. Oh, you don't want to do this one. People say, oh, look at the, the ministers living off the people. Well, they had 12 loaves of bread on this table, and... Once a week, the priest would take that bread out, and he'd have to eat it. Now, think of bread laying on a table for seven straight days. I don't want to eat that bread. There's nothing. It's just, it, it, it shows, people say, what's the symbolism of this? It shows that the God of Israel, even though they offer him this symbolic offering of bread, he doesn't eat. He doesn't eat. He doesn't sleep. There are things that God doesn't do. God is God no matter the time of day. But what does little Samuel do? Little kid. He goes into the temple, and notice where he goes. Verse 3, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. They would let it burn. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the God was, then the Lord called Samuel. Notice, he's not just in the holy place, he's in the holy of holies, and he's going to sleep. Now, this says something, I'm not sure what, about little kids and their relationship to God. Notice, the little kid can go into the temple of God, and God is going to call him in that temple. Unbelievable. I, I don't know how to fully explain this. And God called Samuel, and Samuel said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went back and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The word called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. 
Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he say, say, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Notice his call. First of all, I would be very convinced if I had one of these prophetic calls that I was a prophet. Now, is it a real prophet or a false prophet? That would be a, a thing I'd have to pray about a lot. But um, if you look at prophets, they have calls like Isaiah. He, he go, he's going into the temple to do something, and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe, Isaiah 6, the train is the little bit at the bottom of the robe. In this vision, it's just a vision, that little bit at the bottom of his robe filled the temple. So in other words, God is greater than the temple. And what does Isaiah say? Well, he, he sees the seraphim doing this and this and flapping their wings, however that works. Uh, but he's there, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Not just the temple, but the whole earth is filled with his glory. And then what happens? He says, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips living among a people of unclean lips. And God cleanses him and all that. But that call is so profound that this first stage is something that we don't always have a record of how God called the prophet, but God convinces the man himself he is a prophet. Okay? Um, now, verse 19 is the second part of that. God, if you read this verse with me, the Lord was with Samuel and he grew up and that none of his words fall to the ground. Now, that's a good translation of that. Some translations just say he let none of his words fail or fall, but it's, he did not let his words fall to the ground, which is a very graphic way of saying he didn't fail. So, uh, all of a sudden, this kid who's growing up now, he says something, and uh, by the way, I, I would uh, not... I'd be careful if I were you. I'd have my seatbelt on going home uh, because that guy in that pickup truck is going to slam on his brakes in front of you. Uh, and what happens? Some guy in a pickup truck, <laughs> whatever <laughs> the scene was. If that guy says that and it comes true, you start saying, okay. And then the next time you say, okay. And then pretty soon everybody starts talking and said, yeah, he, the little kid said this to me and he said this to me. God did not let his words fall to the ground. God convinces everyone. And then the, the third stage um, in verse 20. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is up on the north. Beersheba is down on the south. The furthest major cities recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. See, that's how God makes a prophet. So, someone says, I'm a prophet. Okay. What was your call like? What is it? What is it? Uh, Jeremiah, for example, uh, 2318. Um, I'm running out of, I've got one minute here. But Jeremiah has a great test. He's talking about, and you read the 23rd chapter about the false prophets. They make him shudder. And, um, but he said, uh, he basically challenges them to tell what it was like to both see and hear the word of God. If you've stood in the counsel of God, you would have seen and heard. How do you see the word? Well, God gives you a vision of it. You hear what God says. And so, um, uh, there are new, there's New Testament texts, and I don't have time to do this, but uh, you can read through these things. There are three tests that both Paul and John uh, seem to, I'll, I'll 
mention them. Uh, one test about a New Testament prophet is, what does a man say about Jesus? You can read those texts. If he says something heretical, no, we're not talking about what Jesus looked like or whatever. We're talking about what does he say about who this person was? Did he become a human being? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, you know. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 John chapter 4. Uh, does he submit to apostolic authority? We believe, and base this on the New Testament, that the real test of a prophet is does he submit to what the apostles said? If he doesn't want to submit, I, I heard one guy who claimed to be a prophet say, well, it's been said to you that the love of money is the root of all evil. But I tell you, this is him, this is not me. I tell you, it is the lack of money that is the root of all evil. No, it's the love of money. Um, that's the root of all evil. But the real thing in 1 John 4 and 1 Corinthians is does a, does a person have love? The greatest gift, according to Paul, was to, for a person to love. If you've got an unloving, unkind, uncharitable person, that doesn't mean he can't preach a hellfire and brimstone sermon, because Jesus did that. But does he love people? Would, would the, uh, like Matthew 23, we looked at that, and would he weep over Jerusalem because he loved them? How many times would I have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings? But you would not. Do you hear that thing? So uh, those, I think, are the New Testament texts. So next week, we'll start with Obadiah. Okay, I'll look at that. And the principle I'm going to deal with is, I'll use sometimes technical terms, uh, the doctrine of intrusion. Intrusion is where the future comes into the present. John 3.16 he that believes in the Son, believes, uh, believes in, I can't quote John 3, 16 now, believes in the Son, uh, has, not will have, has eternal life. The future has become present. And that works not only in the area of blessing, but also judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we Thank you that we can examine these things and think about them, ponder them. Father, as we face people in this world who become claimed to be prophets, may we let them prove whether they are or they are not. Uh, save us from the things that are false, God. Uh, save us from lies and deceit. We pray your blessing on us in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.